Well, none of that is VLPA, so. No, exactly. All right, feel free to keep filtering in, but the Slido is live. There's a problem on the board. So yeah, at some point, just pull up the Slido questions and like answer a few questions. That's what I'm gonna try and do today, thank you. And they'll start coming while you're answering them. Yes, I have, I have slides that say questions. If I don't remember to do it, that's when I should pull it out. Half on, half on, okay. Okay, I somewhat assume this is a familiar one at this point, so take like another 30 seconds, check that that Slido is active, put in some guesses. If you'll notice, this slide is asking for the code model, the Slido is asking for the big O, two different things. So don't be tricked by Tricky Casey. <laughs> Let's start to talk about this one. Okay, so if you remember when we do these code models, we sort of count like a quote basic instruction as one unit of mysterious runtime something. And I like to kind of start from the inside of control structures and go out. So I would probably personally start with that print lin line that's inside of the most inner for loop. Uh, maybe with a show of fingers, how many, how many points would we give to that one? Yeah, yeah, I like it. You know what, if you held up a two, yeah, maybe we give one for the dot get. Maybe that counts as one instruction. And then the act of printing it out, that counts as two instructions. Like I said, we don't care so, so much about the specifics. 
but maybe we'll give that a two. Uh, then we have this for loop that runs from zero to size. And now if you notice, nothing here is called n. I did that on purpose. All the ones on uh, Monday, they had a parameter input that was like called n. In this case, I didn't specifically call something n. You have to decide what n is. Um, so how, how many times does this inner for loop run, just the inner one? What would we say the, the number of runtime units of that total for loop is? Anyone want to raise their hand and maybe give me what they think? Yeah. Size, number of times, absolutely. And though I didn't call it n, that array list called list, that's going to store your total input. So in this problem, size can also be referred to as n. That's your n. So whenever you're trying to figure out like what's n in this context, look at that input data structure, and it's that number of total items coming into you. So I would call this n. Then we have an outer for loop. How many times does that outer for loop run? It's related. Yeah, way in the back. Also n, absolutely, because it's also based on list.size. So now that we've got these sort of like, we've got the innermost uh, instruction, that's iterated on n times, and then that whole thing is iterated on n times, we have to do multiplication because the print line is going to get executed n times for every n times. So we end up with 2n squared as the code model. Does anyone have any questions on how I got to the code model? Yes. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, in our convention, we don't count the operations in the for loop itself. Does that feel like an oversight? Yeah, but that's the convention. Any other questions? OK. So like I said, this is the code model. But if we go over to the Slido, which I can do, let's see, present. Now I asked you in the Slido not for the code model, but for the big O. And if you remember, when we do big O's, we have to do this thing where we sort of uh, disappear all of the constants and all of the coefficients. So. I agree with those that are also now a uh, fair weather fan diving on board with this top answer here. <laughs> Shout out. Remember, I do not grade these on correctness. Uh, but yes, uh, O of n squared is the correct big O. We drop that coefficient too, because remember, this is a complexity class. And anything that is within this complexity class with only the differential of a coefficient, we group all together. I'm going to get into some really painful and math-specific definitions in a second here about that. But remember, we drop the coefficients, we drop the constants when we write the big O. Any questions on that? Great. OK. OK, hang on. How do I? Oh, look. OK, I've got it. Sweet. OK. So some very quick announcements. So today, your first project is due at 11.59 this evening. Your second project, because we use zero-based counting for the projects, uh, your project one, that is being released this evening. It will be due a week from today, Wednesday. And then I will give you a heads up, the third project that will go out, that's a multi-week assignment. Um, does that mean that you have multiple weeks to do a week's worth of work? No, no teacher would ever do that. It's just a heftier assignment. Prepare yourselves. Yeah? Um, and then hopefully you are also aware that exercise zero is out. It went out on Monday. It will be due next Monday. Any course administrative questions at this time? Cool, great. Because we have a painful amount of stuff to go through. So here's what I'm going to tell you. I know, and you're going to put it on my evals, and you're entitled to put it on my evals, that I'm going to talk really fast. And you're going to be like, Casey went really fast through things. You're right. I like to think of my slides, because we don't have a textbook in this class. This is a resource for you. So I put more in the slides than I personally can speak to. And so you'll notice what I might do is flip through sides rather quickly, and I'll say things like, you can look at this later. 
That's because I think what's on that slide is more useful to you at a later time, even if I'm not going to talk through it. So I promise if I zoom by something, it is for intention. And if you're at all confused, don't worry. There's section and other times for you to work through it. This is one of those sections. Uh, some very helpful TAs a number of quarters ago put, through, put in some slides to explain a little bit more about the next programming assignment, the one that comes out today. It's called DEX. And so what you are going to be doing is implementing a new ADT, the ADT that is called a DEC. Because like last week, we talked all about ADTs. Get it? Yeah. You're going to implement it with like an array and some linked lists. Whoa, who would have thought? Very cool. Um, the one thing we wanted to add in here that's a little weird about this is so the thing that is unique about the DEC is it's essentially a queue, but you can access both the front and the back. So I, I don't know exactly, like I'm trying to think of my bank analogy, but it's sort of like maybe somebody's pulling from the front of the line and somebody's pulling from the back of the line, right? In order to make your code nicer, it's going to encourage you to use these things called sentinel nodes, which is essentially just sort of like, I like to think of them as the bumpers on either side of the queue. You just sort of add these sort of dummy nodes at the beginning and at the end. It makes your code a lot cleaner, but this is just a visual for you. Um, and the Sentinel nodes tends to be the thing that confuses people. So you can look at this slide. Once you've read the project right up, it'll probably make more sense. When in doubt, please feel free, of course, to ask questions on the ed board and come to office hours. Um, yes. Uh, this is just a slide that goes into a little more detail about the grade scope process and testing. Um, with this project, you're going to have some grade scope only tests, which means when we give you the code, there was some unit tests in it that you got, and then you ran on your local machine, and you could see the nice green check marks in IntelliJ. Some tests are now only going to be available on Gradescope, meaning you might like run your code locally, and you pass all those tests, and then you submit it to Gradescope, and it's like, oh, but there's some other stuff you have to work on. There's reasons why some of those tests we can give you locally, and some have to stay on Gradescope. But it means, from here on out, even if you get all of the green check marks, on your assignment locally, it doesn't necessarily mean you're done. So you should regularly be checking it into Gradescope, seeing what score you get, and then figuring things out off of that. But a caveat, one, just so you know, there are no private tests. So whatever test scores you get on your homework, that's your score. We're not hiding anything from you. It might take you a few sort of submissions to Gradescope to try things out. You can submit as many times as you want to Gradescope, but there is one little limiter rule. It's not actually really our rule so much as Gradescope's rule so that we don't crash their servers. If you like dump a bunch of Gradescope submissions in there in like a six hour period, it'll start to limit you and tell you you can't do that. So if you start to encounter that, it should be a flag for yourself that like, oh, I run this against Gradescope. Maybe I failed some Gradescope tests. I read what those are. And then I should go try to write tests on my own machine to figure out how to solve the problem Gradescope's telling me. You don't really want to be using Gradescope as its own sort of like testing framework, because it will kick you out and kill the servers and all that good stuff. Does anyone have any questions about this? It'll make more sense once you like really start submitting to Gradescope and seeing what's going on. Cool. OK, um, here's some like helpful things about working with a partner. Um, I think working with a partner on code is one of the most important things that you will do, because nobody writes code alone. And also, knowing how to use Git and to collaborate, all that stuff is good. A sizable percentage of you will do this thing, where you will find some partners. And then you will notice from here on out, most of our assignments are multi-part. And you'll do this thing where you'll be like, Partner A, you do this part. Partner B, you do that part. And then we'll just combine this code together that neither of us has looked at half of, and that will be fine, and it will not be fine, OK? I encourage you to explore something called pair programming. You probably actually want to do these assignments, two brains working on one thing. The like divide and conquer method rarely seems to be successful in this class. But. Will you take my advice? Probably not. So at least I've said it aloud, and you're adults, and I'll let you decide what's right for you. OK. Any questions about the project before we get into the material we have to learn today? OK. Yes? Uh, 
So there's this thing called pair programming. And that doesn't sound like an official thing, but it is an official thing. And it's got all of this theory behind it. And what it usually means is two humans looking at the same screen. And then you trade off between roles. We call one role the driver, which is the person like typing. And then one person, the navigator. And they're the ones usually being like, oh, kind of like we should type this, type that, whatever's going on. And the way pair programming works according to theory is those two roles need to swap like every few hours or so. You'll probably find the swap rhythm that works best for you. Lots of research has been done. Pair programming makes magic happen. There's something about, oh, I'm just sort of listening versus I'm directing and having switched those positions, two faces, one screen. Magic happens, I promise you. Also, then you can go into any interview and be like, oh yeah, Professor Casey told me we should do this thing called pair programming. And your interviewer will be like, you did pair programming? I'm so impressed. What an industry standard, my gift to all of you. So that's my suggestion, but find the way that works best for you, honestly. Any other questions? Cool. Okay, big O, great. So we sort of um, like very briefly at the end of lecture on Monday got to this formal definition of big O. Previously I'd been sort of like, ah, if there's no loops constant, ah, if there's one loop linear, right? But we're gonna get into the portion of the course now where I used to make people do math. I'm going to show you math instead. So here's our formal definition in that purple box there. F of n, which is our function of runtime, that's our code model. So F of n is in the set of big O of G of n if there exists positive constants C and n naught such that all values of n are greater or equal to n naught and such that that function f of n is less than that constant c multiplied by whatever, you know, big O sort of uh, class, complexity class you're comparing it to. It's a bunch of fancy language, but what it means is, is that to prove something is in this specific big O, there must be some value of n after which all of this is true. That value of n is probably zero in a lot of cases, but if you remember that sort of like on your homework assignment at the end of last, there are some where maybe there's like one growth rate for a period of time and then it changes to another growth rate that tends to infinity. You can still prove that that's in the like second rates big O because we can find an n naught after which the growth rate is consistent. So there's some moment in time that's the n naught after which we only care about the growth rate after that. Yes? Wow, thank you. That was not a plant. Um, OK, so what I'm also going to show you is you can see the little alligator mouth here means less than or equal to. And to our friend's question, we could say have like the, like let's take our f of n from the warm up, f of n of 2n squared. Well, that satisfies all of these rules for n squared. It also satisfies all these rules for n cubed or n to the 4 or n factorial. So actually this definition of big O is just upper bounded, but not necessarily tight upper bounded. And I'm going to explain what tight is in like four slides. But great question. Yes? So C, that's the coefficient. And so that's, if you remember when I was showing you those graphs, I was like, oh, look, if you look at like n and 2n, they look really different at small values of n. But then we zoom out, and they look like they're almost on top of each other. That's what the C is. It's the coefficients. And so what this is saying is, for example, if I was comparing like, hey, is 2n you know, upper bounded by 3n? Yes, because the 2 and the 3 can, you know, be different coefficients. It's not about the coefficients, it's about the factor of n. In fact, let's talk about how to prove this with the C and show you why the coefficients don't matter according to our definition. So let's say that we want to show that the f of n of 10n plus 15 is big O of n. So what I'm really comparing here is that 10n plus 15 function to the function of just n. And I want to show that there exists a value c and a value n naught that satisfies that definition in that purple box there. So what I would do is 
I would sort of apply the definition term by term. So I separate them on that plus sign and I would say, okay, well like 10n, is that less than or equal to some c times n for all values of n after some n naught? And then is just the constant 15, is that less than or equal to c times n after which all that stuff? And so there is very formal math ways to do this. This is the way that we do proofs historically in this class, is that I don't care if you pick the best numbers to prove this. I just need that you need to pick some numbers that satisfy this. So I'm going to try and keep it as obvious as possible. So in that first term, if I pick c to be 10, well then I have an equation that says 10n is less than or equal to 10n. And that is true for all values of n. Great. So there's a c that satisfies that term. And then I have 15. If I choose the c of 15 there, is the singular value of 15 less than or equal to 15n? Well, yeah, as long as n is greater than 1. It's 1 or greater, right? Like if n was a fraction, that wouldn't satisfy anymore. But for all positive values of n, just the number 15 will always be less than or equal to 15 times some positive number. So I found a C10 and a C15 that work for the independent terms. Then I can just recombine them. And so I sort of apply those things through and I just satisfy that like, yes, this comparator, that alligator mouth is happy. So now I've added up all my truths. You do a bunch of math. I'm not going to ask you to do this math anymore. But I, what really matters is just that sort of term by term that I can find those Cs and, and nots that satisfy this definition. So what I really want you to take away from this is just there is a rhyme and reason as to why we pick this particular definition of big O. It's just a really formal math way of saying, yes, we care that the overall growth is upper bounded, but we don't care about the coefficient and we only care as n tends towards infinity. That's really what this math is here to prove to you. Does anyone have any questions on this slide? I'm not going to ask you to do these proofs on an exam. Um, I think you might do some practice in a section with your TAs, because I think this does help sometimes when you do it on your own. Um, this is some more detailed stuff of what I just talked through. I'll let you read this slide if you want to practice on your own. Um, it might do a better job than whatever I just articulated verbally. Um, OK, so coming back to our friend's question. Big O is an upper bound. So here we've got the f of n, which is 10n squared plus 15n. Does O of n cubed satisfy our definition of big O? Can we do that same type of proof, but with a big O that we all probably know is significantly larger, doesn't tightly bound this in the same way. And yeah, it does fit the definition. You can do that sort of like C picking, term by term thing. You could look at this in more detail. And so this is mostly just me to show you that like, hey, guess what? A big O is truly just the upper bound and it isn't necessarily the tight bounds. So you could be that person in an interview where they ask you, what's the big O of your code? And you just always, regardless of what it is, say n factorial, because that's like the worst runtime that will always upper bound everything. Don't be that person, but that person's technically correct. And technically correct does win the day quite often. But yes, this is just to show you that big O is that sort of upper bound definition. You might be like, okay, Casey, like, why do we care about it? Because guess what? I'm about to give you more definitions. So it's an upper bound. It's a fit. Here's maybe how to visualize it. That helped me too. Um, so you were probably thinking of big O kind of like this graph here on the right, where, you know, like there's the graph of n squared, and maybe there's the graph of 10n squared plus 15n, but it's like a really large value of n here. They kind of almost like as you zoom out, they look like they start to sit on top of each other. But technically, you know, like if we have 10n squared plus 15n, n cubed, n to the 4, n to the 5th, we'll always forever upper bound those as well. So those are also valid big O's of that f of n. Okay, great. Before I add more things, 
look, I'm even doing the thing. I said I was going to use the Slido questions thing, and I can do that. Let's look if there's any questions. Oh, what a good question. Are there Zoom office hours? Yeah, there are some Zoom office hours. Uh, I think it says in each of the individual blocks on the office hours schedule, and that should be where the Zoom link is. I know, for example, like Sonia's holding uh, Zoom office hours on Saturdays. Any other questions at this time before I give you more math? Yeah, and so, exactly. It's technically true, but you probably, like, if you're in an interview and somebody's like, what's the big O of your code? And, like, the real, like, tight big O is linear, but you say n factorial, that doesn't really tell them much, right? So that's why we have other definitions to understand more about our code. What? Oh, look it. Oh, it happened. Oh, interesting. Oh, hey, this is working. Great. Yes. Okay. Oh, why can't we just look at the largest exponent in the f of n and then see if it fits o of n? What a wonderful question. The answer is, heck yeah, you can do that. That's how I do it. I don't do this proof thing all the time. Look at it. Be like, what's the biggest, what is the biggest term of n? That's the dominating term. That's the big O. On Friday, we're going to do recursive code modeling, and you're going to find that sometimes you can't just like visually see it, and so you have to do all this fancy math stuff. So I'll show you why sometimes that breaks down. But for pretty much everything other than recursive code, you can do that. And that's fine. And that's also why I'm like, ah, I'm not going to make them do proofs anymore. That's silly. Um, have I ever had someone say O of n factorial in an interview? No, that's true. I haven't. I've been making this joke for a while. I almost, it would be one of those, like, I'm not even mad. I'm just impressed. If somebody really tried to like pull that confidence move on me in an interview, don't do it, though. Other people won't think it's funny. I would think it's funny. Other people won't. Um, let's see. Great. Um, okay, great. Oh, okay, yes. So this, I will say, is it is technically bounded by n squared. It is. We would say 10n squared plus 15n is in the set of big O of n squared. It's how you say it math-wise according to set theory, but that is true. Um, would we ever have to do big O proofs in an interview? No. Um, I kind of show you the proofs because, for example, if you are sitting here and interested in getting into the CS department, our CS department, I will tell you right now, compared to other CS departments, is a pretty theory-heavy CS department, which means you will take some theory classes where you will write a lot of proofs in the CS courses. And it's just so that you, as computer scientists, can prove that you know what you know. But in industry, when people say something, for the most part, we're like, yeah. We trust that you know that thing. We're not asking people to do proofs in industry. It's mostly just an academic computer science thing, which is part of why I cut it from the class. Cool. OK, wonderful questions. Keep them coming in. The TAs are going to keep answering them. Um, OK, let's talk about another type of code model. I missed an animation there. Um, OK, I think we have time. Why don't you take like three minutes, look at this code, and discuss with the people around you what the code model of this would be. And I will tell you, you can probably find the code model according to the rules we've been using, but I want you to think about what the runtime is going to be on this code whenever that if statement conditions to true. Go ahead. Discuss for like three minutes. We'll come back together.
you haven't had a chance, talk to people about what values of n are going to trigger that if statement, what that means to the runtime. Think about the runtime graph. And we're going to discuss in like 30 seconds. Let's talk through this. So hopefully we can apply our usual strategy of sort of counting the basic, air quotes, uh, instructions here. So let's see if I did the animations correct on this one. OK, there we go. So there's maybe like the basic instructions I would throw out there. One for each assignment and return. Maybe I give that if check two because there's like a mod and an e comparator, but again, like, you know, it is. Yeah, question? Sorry, are the, oh, shouldn't that get a plus two as well, the else statement? Ah, okay, I think I know what you're referring to, and hang on. So let's maybe talk about this whole if else structure, what would happen. So I guess here's my question back to you is that just that line of the if to test mod n equals zero, do we agree that's a plus two? Cool. So the way that this code works, right, is that's going to happen every single iteration, right? So we're always going to do that plus two. If it's true, then we return true, which is a plus one. If it's false, then we're going to return false, which is a plus one. So actually, kind of regardless of which branch of the if statement it goes into, just doing the test and then running one of those branches will be a plus three. I kind of did that on purpose to make the branches equal to make your math a little easier on you in this case. But is that sort of the question that you're asking about the branches there? Oh, sorry. You know what? I do agree. I like that. When I said two test plus plus yesterday, I said that's like really two actions happening, right? An increment and a reassignment. You've convinced me. Yeah, I agree. I would change that to a two. Sure. Good catch. I like that. OK, well then, theoretically, we have somewhere between three and four, regardless, you know, depending on which if statement branch we go in here. But like kind of overall, we've got like three or four for the entirety of the if branch. Now we've got this while loop. How many times does a while loop run? Yeah, question? Oh, it's about the if statement. Sure, yeah. Yes, it would. And like in this case, because those are like a constant off, we would probably not care. But you could imagine what if one of the if statements was like, calls a method and did a bunch of stuff, or like did it contains one of the other methods, like did another method call that did a bunch of other stuff. So yes, depending on the branch, you could have very different runtimes. In this case, it's like mostly negligible, but yes. Oh, um, you would actually end up writing like either three or four. But um, in this case, because we don't care about the constants of the two of those, I'm just going to collapse them together. So now here is the actual tricky part. How do we, how, what is the overall runtime of this while loop? What would we want to put against this while loop? Four or five, sorry, four or five. Oh, okay, like I mean, it's running from the value two, it's gonna count up and it's going to run until either I return true and if I never return true, it's gonna loop until some value n. So what would we say the number of iterations of the while? Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would say n2. But there's that return inside of that if statement, which if you read that, if you notice, is going to trigger on every even value of to test. What a good question. It's sort of like sometimes, how do we represent that? Like 
And the real answer is, and I'm trying to trick y'all, you can't actually really combine this sort of thing into one equation. And so this is also why we care about the big O being the upper bound. Because it's like, oh, well, sometimes it's like a really small number. And sometimes it's n. But if I'm going to design the systems for this code, I probably, if I design for a, you know, a linear runtime, then that constant runtime like, will be fine. We're sort of pessimists, if you will, when we're designing computer science. I kind of want to know like, what's the longest it will run. That's why we have this obsession with big O. But let me show you the graph of what this runtime actually looks like. Yeah, question. Yeah, that's probably true too. Thank you. Yeah, great. I should check, fix this slide. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, the alligator mouse the wrong direction, right? Because it never returns true. Yeah, absolutely. So let's assume that code doesn't have those typos in it. This is what that code would sort of look like. And this is actually like the act of finding prime numbers. If I was like trying to find the value, if the value of 10 is a prime number, 10's mod by 2. And so I would like immediately you know, dive out of that. So all even values very, very quickly. And also, you know, like values that have, say, you can see the fives here. Very quickly, I can find that the values of five, like, they aren't prime numbers. And so in this particular case, we have to do a lot more loops on the actual prime number to get to the, you know, return true situation, or return false situation, that kind of stuff. It happens at different rates. So we have a graph. This is not about as n tends to infinity. This is about different specific values of n, where we have sort of like two different growth rates interwoven. You could kind of imagine if I drew the like uh, lines between this, it would sort of look like a bunch of spikies, like a big oscillating spiky here. So what the heck do we do? What's the big O of that? Well, remember we care about the upper bound. So even though we kind of have like a situation where the bottom there looks like a constant, the big O is like, well, I still need to know like what's the worst case scenario. So we're going to consider this to be a linear big O because that's the upper bound. But if I just said the linear big O, like the big O of this is linear, it kind of feels like we're not getting the whole picture of this runtime relationship, right? It's not like that graph on the right-hand side where we're like, oh, telling us that the big O of O of n is O of n, that feels like it's like really descriptive. But in our sort of is prime example, it's not so descriptive. It's like we need more things to describe what's going on. Meet big omega. It is the opposite side of the coin to big O. So if big O is the upper bound, big omega is the lower bound. So this particular graph has a big O of linear, of n, and a big omega of constant, or the omega symbol and then a 1. And if you look at the definition there, it is literally exactly the same as big O, but we flipped the alligator mouse. So you still have to do that C and n not thing to prove it, but it's just like, what's the sort of like slowest growing runtime rate as n's increase instead of just the fastest growing. Like, what's the, you know, fastest the code could run as opposed to the slowest the code could run? What? Yeah. So here also, if it helps visually, if that black line 2n cubed is the line that we're comparing, then n cubed would be considered its big omega because it will satisfy. Remember in our little definitions, its big O is greater than or equal to and big omega is less than or equal to. So the equal to matters. So the omega of this can also be n cubed, but it also could be n squared. It also could be n. It also could be constant. It's another one of those where it's like lower bounded, but by definition, it's not tight. It's not a fit. It's a bound. So if you get where I'm possibly going with this, our third and final definition, uh, like here we've got a situation, right, where we've got the graph on the left, like, oh, great, I needed sort of an upper and lower bound. That, that's nice to know. It's good to see that. Versus the other one, it feels like 
sort of like the big O and the big omega are like redundant, they're the same. Meet big theta. <laughs> big theta is the what if it's the exact fit. Uh, and so you can see again, like it is one of those things where it is about having two sort of bounds on either side. And if the two bounds on either side are the same complexity class. That's like the math definition. Again, I don't care so much about the math definition. If it helps you, what I will tell you is if the tightest big O and big omega are the same complexity class, then that is the big theta. So fit, the best fit line, that kind of helps your brain too, called the big theta. Casey, in interviews, aren't they almost really asking for the big theta, but they call it the big O? Why, yes, imaginary student. That's also why people in industry, if you say the terms big omega and big theta to anyone in industry, they will either be like, oh, maybe I remember that from undergrad once upon a time, or they will be like, I have never heard those terms. These are very academic things. I use it to deepen your understanding of the limits of big O. And now if you ever get into an argument and you have to pull this out, because I have pulled this out, it will shut people up really fast because they realize that they've just been waving their hands and doing gut checks of big O instead of actually doing their proofs. And often, sometimes, they can be wrong. But you are now armed with two more tools in your arsenal for debate. So what about our example here? I said if the tightest big O and the tightest omega are the same, then that's the theta. But we've got a situation here where the tightest big O is linear and the tightest omega is constant. And those are different complexity classes. So this is an exception. The big theta does not exist. I don't know why I will forever hear it in Lindsay Lohan's vice, but now hopefully you will too. <laughs> so yes, there are situations where the big theta does not exist. That tells us that there is not a singular growth rate across all values of n. Great, so now we've got the upper, we've got the lower, we've got the equal to, here's all of our definitions, that's all hunky-dory. Let's do some examples. Oh, great. Okay, if you port your slides over from Microsoft PowerPoint to Google Slides, it will just turn all of your animations into one. Is that what just happened? Yeah, great, there you go. Um, but here you can just sort of see, and because we do have to talk about some more stuff in the next few minutes. Uh, this symbol here, this like weird rounded E, means in the set of. Technically, because they're complexity classes and we have these specific values that are stand in, we think of these like complexity classes as like a set of possible functions. So if you want to get really mathematically correct, use that symbol to say 4 of n squared. Is it in the omega of constant? And the answer is, you know, like yes, 4 n squared is lower bounded by constant. It's also lower bounded by linear. It is technically lower bounded by n squared, but it is not lower bounded by n cubed or n to the fourth. And if we go on the other side, it is not upper bounded by constant. It's not upper bounded by linear. It is upper bounded by n squared, and then n cubed and n to the fourth. And this moment where those two things are true, that's the theta. Questions, questions, questions. In fact, is my next slide a question? Oh, no, OK. It's more notes, but it's not stuff I was going to say aloud to you. This is another one of those, like, you can read this slides. And this is really just saying, um, I've now been using this word tight. Tight means, in the big O context, the slowest of the upper bounds. And the omega is the fastest of the lower bounds. But really, I just mean like the closest possible, the closest fit. That's the tight. Um, and then simplified, if I ever ask you for the simplified tight O bound, the word simplified means if you have a code model, I want you to drop out the constants, drop out the coefficients. So for example, if I ask you for a big O or a big omega, and you give me something like 3n or n squared plus 4, that is not simplified. Drop out those values. I just want the term of n. That's simplified. And if I'm looking for the thing that is as close as possible to the fit, that's the tight word that I'm talking about. 
Great, that's the slide I was looking for. I'm going to pop over to the Slido. Does anyone have any questions so far? Maybe I do a refresh. Yes, please. Thank you. Oh, like what if the graph doesn't start from zero? Yes, yeah, so that you have to find that n naught where that growth function, you know, you can see that tending towards infinity. But for context, we don't care about uh, like negative n values. So even if your growth rate, like maybe it doesn't start at zero, maybe it like right off the bat it starts at a thousand because you do something really expensive at the very beginning, that's fine. I don't care about where on the y axis it starts, I care about its growth trajectory. Oh yeah, because like where like where it starts on the y-axis, that still fits our definition based on that like coefficient thing. So for example, like let's say it's like is n plus a thousand upper bounded by n, and so in that context, you would sort of like start that n up a thousand on the y-axis, and this n would start here. But like that plus thing that still fits within our uh, definition of the big O. So that sort of constant is OK. Yeah? Ah, yes, we also drop the coefficients and the constants in big theta and big omega as well. So simplified tight applies to all three of our happy family here. Um, I want to see if there's anything new in here. Oh, yeah. Is my takeaway from this the thought process or the actual arithmetic? The thought process, the thought process. I'm trying really hard to eliminate as much arithmetic from this class. It's not a math class, but math is how we know things. If there's any math majors in here, I know. You're the purist. Okay, I'm trying to just show you how we know things. <laughs> um, let's say, if you have code that runs in n squared until n equals 1,000, and then after that it runs in constant. Ah, this is a good question. You have code that runs in O of n squared until, say, n equals 1,000, and then after that it like levels out. Something weird happens in the code. What do you guys think? What's the big O? Is it n squared or is it O of 1? O of 1, because then our n naught just has to be 1,000. I don't care if that's a really big number. I don't care if n naught's 10,000, as long as it goes until after. Ah, darn, I didn't get to case analysis. OK. We're out of time. I will have to pick up with case analysis on Friday. Please come back on Friday. We're going to do some really fun, tricky stuff with recursion. Look forward to it. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. See you Friday. <laughs>